Hello and welcome to The Road to Autonomy. The Road to Autonomy is brought to you in part by Stantec Generation AV. Stantec Generation AV combines some of the most experienced AV experts in the industry with the resources of a global engineering firm. Stantec Generation AV provides education, consulting, assessment, and guidance to any industry interested in autonomous vehicles. Learn more at Stantec.com. Hello and welcome to The Road to Autonomy. I'm your host, Grayson Brulte. On today's episode, we're absolutely honored to have Cameron Greta, Director of Business Development, Spartan Radar. Welcome to the podcast, Cameron. Glad to be here, Grayson. I'm happy to have you here because you're one of the coolest cats in autonomy. You've got better and more stories than anybody I know, and plus you're a ton of fun to hang out with. Oh, you're too kind. I I want to point this out. My daughter's beginning to surf now. She's got this really awesome surf coach now who's an incredible gentleman. And we were waxing the board a while back, and you sent this really nice comment to my wife, so thank you for that. So you surf. And my daughter says, please ask Mr. Gita if he's ever surfed near a shark, because you surf in Northern California. There's big chomper sharks. I've watched Shark Week like a lot of people. And I see in Santa Cruz the big great whites come in close. Mm -hmm. Have you ever surfed near a great white or a shark up there? Well, definitely, but never knowingly, right? So the scary thing about great whites is if you see them, you're basically safe because they're going to attack you from directly underneath and basically there's no hope. But I've never actually seen one close to me in the water up there, but certainly I've seen them surfing in other places. I've surfed with crocodiles in Costa Rica in the water with me, east coast of Costa Rica, and seen big tiger sharks on the Pacific coast of Mexico looking for you. So gray whites are, are a little more rare than those other animals. So I feel for the most part comfortable as long as I'm not the slowest guy in the water. With a tiger shark, you're the slowest guy in the water. No matter what. Yeah, that was a clear the, clear the break immediately kind of situation. 15 foot tiger shark will get you out of the water real fast. Because aren't they known as, what is it, the garbage cans of the sea because they eat everything, license plates, body parts, you name it, they eat it? A great white will strike you and sort of feel with its mouth, unfortunately, neoprene and fiberglass and whatnot and kind of go meh and usually go away. A tiger shark is not, or a bull shark for that matter, is going to pursue you until it eats you typically, if it can. For the history buffs out there, Jaws was based on a bull shark in the the river in New Jersey. That was the basis of Jaws. It was. It was. And then they conflated it to a a great white to make, got to get Hollywood on board. But yeah, that was the story of that bull shark that swam up a river and killed some people in New Jersey, was it? Or... But Hollywood had to make it an enormous megalodon to, to sell tickets, of course. <laughs> and, and I'll tell you, the, the, the way that Spielberg shot that and that music, dun-dun, dun-dun. Everybody, even when I go in the ocean today, I'm, I'm looking around and I get that dun-dun in my head. It has ruined everybody. I, I can tell you, I, I do a lot of open ocean swimming, too. And in a swim race, you know, all the Hermosa peer-to-peer and races like that, you're swimming, just staring down into the void, listening to that music in your head as you're going along. Oh, I, I, I can just imagine what goes through your head. You can enjoy that race. I'll watch you and support you and cheer you on, but I'm not taking that chance. Character building experiences. I can tell you that learning to kind of overcome those primal fears and other fears that were generated by media is a challenge, but it's quite cathartic when you can kind of finally relax in that situation understanding the odds, you know, kind of like driving in an autonomous car. No, it, it, re- relaxing's great. Surfing's a great culture. You sit on the board, you're waiting for the waves, and you're very relaxed, and you're in tune with nature. You're feeling the currents and the tides. Uh, how has surfing impacted the way that you look at autonomy and mobility? Because it, it's all about, you get, for autonomy mobility, you got to catch the right trend. It's like with surfing, you got to catch the right wave. I think about that in another way, right? So surfing is typically a matter of timing and it is a matter of access. You don't have waves every day. It's not like you can go to a a bike park and ride jumps that are always there, for instance. You kind of have to be there at the right time at the right place. So in and of that, it's a sport that is somewhat restrictive because of that mobility access. And there's some places in California where the, the locals probably don't want you going there either. But having the ability to move around and go to where the waves are is an issue and probably restricts quite a few people from getting waves. I'm ruining the sport while promoting mobility, but having more adoption of the sport is always great as it grows. 
but getting to the beach, parking, all of those things are a pain in the butt. You look at El Porto, where I surfed a lot in college down in Manhattan Beach, you know, in the 90s, you could go find a parking place, no problem. It was easy to get in and out. But so the issue of, of just everybody driving their own car impacts parking to the point where you can't even enjoy to the beach. And that's just not for surfers. That's for anybody that wants to go to those spaces. So the shared mobility idea, eliminate what well, doesn't eliminate, but certainly it makes it a little bit easier for more people to get to enjoy these resources that are right there off our coast, if you're lucky enough to live in a state that abuts the, uh, the ocean. So, and the hilarious thing that I always think about living in LA is the fact that, oh, in 1918, 1920, I could have caught a train in downtown LA, electric train, and it could have taken me all the way to Huntington Beach or to the beach in Redondo. So the fact that we've gone so far backwards with, with car culture here is interesting and has a profound effect on the way the city moves and the parts of the county that people have access to. It has a profound effect and then has an effect of when I lived out in the area, we had our little area and we never left. I didn't want to sit in traffic. You're trying to to time it to where you can go. And, and we lived in Beverly Hills. My daughter went to school in Brentwood. And not very far, to, you just go down Sunset. And it could take us an hour and a half sometimes. And it's a couple miles because to get over the, the, her school was over the 405. And we had to get over that 405. And it was not, it was not fun. You're just like, okay, you have to actually incorporate traffic into your life. And it's not fun. That's why you really don't want to leave your little neighborhood, a little area that you frequent. And it's completely changed LA. Imagine LA in those days, in the early 1900s, where you could roam around, you can go to Pasadena, you can go down to Redondo, you can go down to Venice, you can have all these great experiences and never think about traffic. That's a wonderful town. That's a wonderful city. Granted, there was far fewer people here at that point in time, but no, it's a it's a pain. I mean, our office with Spartan is down here in North Orange County, Los Alamitos. And if I want to go mountain biking in the afternoon, for instance, up above JPL, getting up the 110, it could take me till dark. So <laughs> not the most convenient place to get around and, and sorely lacking in transportation alternatives. Because once, once you hit the orange, orange curtain, traffic starts. <laughs> and it's just... You take your mask off down here, but... Uh... <laughs> It'll take you a lot of there. California is, is, an, is an interesting place. It's an incredible state. You can surf. You can ride your mountain bike. You can enjoy racing cars and some of the best racetracks in, in the world. And it's also the home of innovation. Silicon Valley has ushered all this stuff in, going back to, to Fairchild Wheeler and all the Lockheed Martin, all the government stuff. For a long time, you operated out of Silicon Valley when you were part of autonomous stuff before they were acquired by Hextagon. And, and you've got this great saying that your office was the number one stop for most mobility startups in Silicon Valley. You would call me up, hey, have you met this company? Have you seen this? They came and showed me this cool thing. And you met so many wonderful, amazing people. You met so many companies that went on to become unicorns and do really great things. Putting all that into context, and you had this incredible insight, what is your take on the current state of autonomy today? It's evolved a ton. So, I mean, if I think about those days this is 2016, 2017, having just left Velodyne and get, getting on board at Autonomous Stuff, it was a brave new world. There was far more money than time, I think, which was symbolic of the pace of what everybody was doing. And, and like you said, most companies who wanted to deploy a vehicle and do autonomous testing were coming to us. And so OEMs like NEO, Intel, Qualcomm, those are the huge players. And of course, the two simples, Auto X, everybody else that have really grown up in the space. The evolution is profound. I mean, and I think with the vehicle hardware piece, why autonomous stuff was so important was because everybody was so wholly focused on software, the higher technology parts, the, the shiny city in the sky kind of thing where they didn't consider vehicle actu you know, actuating brake pedals and wiring things properly inside the test vehicle. So we filled in that space for so many companies to really allow them to accelerate their developments and, and really make it. But today it's changed completely. I hearken back to a conversation I had actually at an SAE event with you, that uh, LA commotion, when a top executive from Renault sits in the car and I'm doing the autonomous spiel. And he's kind of impressed, but not really. And then he looks over at me, he says, well, 
your company takes these vehicles from Ford or from Lexus and modifies them and sells them to researchers. What happens, Mr. Gita, when Renault provides the vehicle from the OEM with an autonomous plug-in and goes to your customers? And the first thing I said, well, I'll call you for a job. <laughs> <laughs> the second thought is like, do you want that liability? Do you want that the maintenance that goes along with those interactions? And they're slowly, we, you know, I think the Leaf and other Nissan vehicles are being used to kind of replace that autonomous stuff vehicle. But according to people I know that are using those vehicles, all the same challenges are still there. Tuning actuators, having reliable plugins, it's, it's not easy, even for an OEM. And I don't think we will reach this point of continuity with AV systems, especially the higher levels, until a Zooks or something like this really hit deploys a vehicle that was designed with autonomy in mind. Because up until today, we're still dealing with modifications of antiquated, not antiquated, but modifications of current technology to to basically make a self-driving car all the way up to Waymo. So that's there's a big lift here for the OEMs to sort of design these systems that are more accommodating to autonomy. And, and we're kind of sort of seeing that, but but it still seems like it's quite a ways away. Another thing that's quite a ways away is is operating at a business, and I got to You worked for Bobby Hambrick, and Bobby's been on the podcast before. A really great gentleman. He ran it as a business. He he gambled and sacrificed his assets to build a business and ran it as a profitable business. That's one thing that's lacking today. You have a few CEOs in the space. Don Amon has said this is not a science project. This is a business. Brian Selesky has been forefront. We operate a business. When does the rest of the industry come around and say, guess what, guys? This is a business. We're past the R&D phase. We have investors. We have a fiduciary duty for return on capital. We're going to start operating this as a business. When will that become more mainstream? Well, if you look at the autonomy market as a whole, there is already mainstream businesses in factories operating autonomous vehicles. So the, the automated guided cart, automated different vehicles to convey parts and assemblies. Tesla Gigafab uses them extensively. Companies like Daifuku Web and a company called Adept that, that Omron recently purchased. And they, they represent huge gains in efficiency on the factory floor. And then when you pull that out into the into the wild and think about developing a profitable business around, around autonomy, it's difficult because you end up with going back to this idea of it's difficult to create the vehicle to accommodate the business, all of your software or logistical service, you end up with a, a very expensive platform to move a very inexpensive thing if you're thinking about the logistical space. And it seems like the taxi idea really only makes sense in a dense urban situation where they can have enough iter iterative rides during the day to kind of cross that profit barrier. So I feel like we're certainly getting there. And I think companies you know, Waymo and, and Argo and Cruise and Lyft, all of them are kind of finding that sweet spot of where do we need to deploy? What is the cost of the platform we're deploying with? A $10 million vehicle for a ride does makes absolutely no sense whatsoever. And then the adoption, are people excited about these products coming to the market? That's the one thing I've, I've yet to see. We're in somewhat of a bubble out here in Silicon Valley, and I would observe there's maybe a similar bubble in Michigan of like, this is the future. This is the place we're going. But when I talk to people on the road or, you know, that are not really in the industry or even giving rides to people that have never experienced that, it's so far from their thinking that until it's a really relevant means of transportation, it's hard to see great profit margins for these players, especially on the moving people part, the robo taxi business. And we'd seen that shift. So Early on, AutoX was an interesting example, and many of them entered with the idea of just doing autonomous taxi. And I think that was logical. The usage of Uber was really constantly growing, displacing the taxi industry. So it made sense, maybe, maybe, and, and of course, Uber's investments and tries to do autonomy. But it doesn't really equate when the business doesn't pay for these expensive machines and expensive autonomy stacks. So you shift it to logistics where there is those needs. We all want our Amazon deliveries instantaneously. So I think COVID helped drive 
far greater adoption of autonomy in the logistical space, whether that's a small sidewalk delivery robot, which we see operating on university campuses in cities, or, you know, with Zooks and Amazon teaming up, they want to deliver boxes. They don't necessarily want to deliver people. I think the people is a good story, but the logistical shortcomings and our constant increase in ordering things online, I think, creates a, a pretty wide open space for autonomous deliveries, which will probably come before uh, before I can catch an autonomous cab from LA from downtown LA to LAX. You're right about logistics. We see that you read the Wall Street Journal, the Financial Times, every single day, there's an article, sometimes two articles, about the global supply chain. There's not enough trucks to move the goods that are coming there. There's not enough labor at the ports to move this stuff. And that's why I'm a big fan, as you know, of autonomous trucking. Autonomous trucking will shore up the supply chain. There's a meaningful path to massive revenue there. When I, when I look at autonomous trucking, I think a lot about the mining industry with, with cats doing in Australia and those mines. They're profitable the way that they're moving. And that's autonomy in a really good business sense where it makes a lot of sense. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I think we're evolving to that point. The Port of LA is a crazy example. If you if you go to the beach, if you can make it there and get a parking spot, you will notice, especially if you're south of Long Beach, I don't know, I think we counted 70 container ships out there last week waiting to be unloaded. So it's not only just the getting on the road, it's really even unloading those containers. There's, there's certainly a space for autonomy there and drayage that people are exploring and then getting it up to the road. And I think it's those are solvable problems. If you think about where these goods move in Los Angeles, for instance, it's going from Long Beach, typically up to some big distribution center in Riverside, out, out east on the 10. It's a pretty constant train of trucks doing that. Granted, on a very old road, the 710 and, and the 10, maybe don't accommodate the operation of an autonomous truck perfectly, nor do the drivers of Los, in Los Angeles. But certainly the ability to move that stuff quickly and deploy it, it affects the economy. It, it's the very beginning of our economic funnel, right? In the U.S. is a, is a consumer, such a consumer country. And you would think that governments would be more than willing to invest in improvements on these systems because it helps the GDP. It goes directly to the bottom line. It increases our ability to, to consume which is our main economic driver. So, and I think we're, we will see success. You know, there's already, I think Two Simples is leading the way and others like Kodiak are close where they go directly to those people that need to deploy these logistical services and find partnerships there, whether that's the postal service or, or UPS or FedEx or a company that's just moving goods from the port to a to a, a warehouse. That's That's really where... There's certainly money to be made if you can you can pick up the efficiencies in those areas. The one thing I'm surprised about this, I wrote to the author of the Wall Street Journal that wrote the article yesterday about supply chain constraints. I said, why not talk about autonomous trucking? I talked to friends of mine that are in government and federal level, state level. I said, why are you not talking about autonomous trucking? We have a global supply chain issue that's causing inflation. That's a big part of the inflation. The cost of goods are going up. I said, t I said, think about this from your politician hat. Autonomous trucking will create jobs. And I broke it through how all the jobs that it will that it will create. And then I said, then you can go tell your constituents on top of that, it'll lower the cost of goods. So that, that box of cereal is now 25 cents cheaper. That's a winning political argument. Why are you not making that argument? Well, I never thought about it that way. <laughs> uh, that's the, that's the, the trouble of the day, right? I mean, and I think that's also a marketing issue and a communication issue for us in the industry. To conflate that situation is Tesla, that there's a lot of schadenfreude around them having issues, but they've kind of created a situation where there's certain fear and sort of uh, distrust around autonomy because of what they call full self-driving. So if I'm a politician and I'm not a technical person, I'm going to think about autonomy. I'm going to think about Elon Musk and I'm going to think about Tesla and really not go beyond that. So I think Silicon Valley and these and, and all these companies need to do a really good job of promoting that, especially on the policy side. That's a key to communicate that these are core economic drivers that need to be adopted. The policies around operating these vehicles 
you still cannot operate a semi truck in California without a driver in it on a public road. It's it's illegal. Not that getting the truck driver out of the vehicle is the biggest goal, but that's one of the goals where we evolve to a point where the, the truck is a cabless skateboard carrying a container. But the drivers have a huge role to play as we cross that bridge, whether they're platooning them or or just monitoring as a safety driver. So a big lift for sure on the policy side, but in the same respect, the, the technology is still, I don't think it's baked enough, I don't feel, to deploy an autonomous truck, Class 8, in its current configuration on the freeway. It could absolutely do it, but my, my concern is nefarious actors in the public messing with it right? Trying to create an accident to, to do some sort of insurance scam or just out of, <laughs> who knows, people just seem to want to mess with robots because there's an availability there. So I, I think a few things have to change. I think it requires infrastructure changes where there's dedicated lanes for these things. The name escapes me, but I just saw a startup that's focusing in on that just this morning where it's really about dedicated lanes and, and having V2V, some sort of infrastructure along those corridors. And you could think about it as a reimagination of a rail system that's living on our roads in kind of a shared situation where there's autonomy in a certain lane, just like the carpool lane. And then we have normal crazy drivers back in the regular space. And I think that creates a safer situation to design around autonomy right from the infrastructure side. And you'd think with this infrastructure bill, there better be a big piece of that committed to these these things in some part. I don't think the, the infrastructure bill is not going to get through in its, in its current form. If it gets through, it's going to be extremely watered down. There's just, there's not a, enough political support for it. Dedicated lanes, interesting, but not, not practical. The other thing to point out is a majority of cargo hauled in trucks is run at night. And these nefarious actors are not going to be able to tell if there's a driver and they are not. I'm very confident in the autonomous technology. I, I don't think that we're going to get there because there was a video that came out yesterday. The police department in Texas released this. A gentleman pretended to get run over by the Tesla at a gas station. Well, th- they turned over the video. The guy jumped in front of the car and laid down. They said, and they arrested the guy for falsifying a police report because they had the video footage. That's going to happen on the passenger side because the majority of the public will never interact with an autonomous truck. They'll never know. Just like the similar, they don't act, interact with a, a locomotive, a Union Pacific, a, a Canadian Pacific uh, running down the highways. This technology is great. It's going to do a lot of really good things. It's going to complement society. And you look at technology and you, and you look at all these different breakthroughs. Radar is changing a lot. You're at Spartan Radar. What, what is Spartan Radar? What makes it special? And, and why, and of all people, did you want to join? <laughs> Absolutely. So, you know, I had been selling optical sensing technologies, microscopes, things like this for my entire career, 20, 20, 30 years now. Radar was always there in the background as an available technology, but one of the reasons machine vision and and LIDAR are so readily accepted is because they're easily understood by human brains, right? I can look at a video image, I can identify a person. LIDAR images produce similarly anthropomorphic images of people and cars and stuff that that we as humans with our eyeballs understand. And, And radar is considerably more esoteric because it literally sees speed, it can see acceleration. It can identify different materials by the reflections off those materials. So all of these things culminate in what I think is a fantastic sensor for driving. And the the main reason I came to talk to Spartan was really because they look at it very differently. They take a very holistic systems engineering approach to the design. So taking in full consideration of antenna design, silicon, how those resources are managed to basically get very high bandwidth, very fast response times. And then on a back end, on the signal processing, that was the really driver for me. So if you think about how a modern LiDAR works, it steers light, it receives light, it doesn't do much processing. You typically have to unload that processing to something else. There's a few companies that are trying to basically get in the middle of that chain to maybe put a bounding box on a LiDAR image as the LiDAR data streams out of the sensor. But it's slow and it's kludgy. So at Spartan, 
We have a team of you know people that had been in the aerospace business for many years, so they understand very deeply the systems engineering piece. And really the part of tersing via algorithms, all of the information that's in that returning signal of radar. And, and I think a lot of the reasons, you know, I think about Tesla bemoaning radar operation, the situation he they described was very consistent with a poorly designed signal processing because they're saying, oh, well, the radar doesn't work because it doesn't agree with the camera. So the radar was showing them something a multi-path or, or, a, or a side lobe that was interpreted as an object that wasn't showing up on the camera. The reason that was happening was because they didn't do proper signal processing and they were seeing noise on the signal and then trying to kind of equate that w- with a camera signal. So w- what we're trying to do is eliminate that noise so the imaging coming out of a radar sensor looks a whole lot like more LIDAR in that it can obviously be used for localization because it has the accuracy to detect objects repeatedly. And of course, it is an optical. It doesn't really care if it's dirty. It doesn't care if it's night or day or raining or foggy. It's far more robust. And that's demonstrated in the fact that there's radar in so many vehicles already. The Hyundai and companies like Subaru, it's almost in every vehicle they produce today. And it's already making a big impact, especially on the AEB emergency braking side, blind spot detection. You know, every time you drive next to somebody and see that little light illuminate in their rear view mirror, you're being detected by a side viewing radar that's mounted in the rear corner of that vehicle. So it's everywhere. It's already being utilized. And our goal is just to make it way better. Is signal processing the special sauce? Signal processing in combination with the proper design of the antenna. So those two things together result in greatly reduced noise. It presents an opportunity to make a less expensive radar by removing or changing the way the elements are distributed, the transmit and receive elements. And then the other thing where we can exploit is the edge. So we have Spartan, the word Spartan kind of talks about the we're doing everything you can with as little as possible, you know, kind of lean and mean. So we want to, or are creating a sensor that sends out actionable data that's important and eliminates all that noise and stuff you don't need to process before it even gets to the the computer or ECU or, or whatever thing you're doing to a, into the nav stack. So th- that, those efficiencies are kind of created with, yeah, a different design of the antenna and then manipulating the uh, signal in a way to eliminate the noise and give you the diamonds of information you really need to know. That raises the question then, can Spartan run on low power ARM chips? Absolutely, absolutely. So you think about the pedigree of of the team here having come from places where, you know, they're designing forward facing radar for a jet fighter. So the F-18, F-35, these, these planes and the silicon that was is inside them is 20 years old. And of course, the budget you get for power and compute in a platform like that, where it's, there's a critical technology, but the efficiencies in these airplanes is amazing. You don't get a lot of processing power. You don't get a lot of time to process. You know, if there's a Sidewinder missile coming at your jet at some very high rate of speed, you better figure out, A, where it is and what's, how fast is it coming towards me almost immediately. And that's the same type of technology you want to deploy in automotive, very low latency, instantaneous results on ego motion above their vehicles, and to do it in a very streamlined way to it, where it doesn't take a GPU. That's interesting. Sometimes we'll talk to big Silicon Valley silicon providers and explain our theory of, of reducing the amount of needs on silicon, and they don't necessarily take kindly to it because... Their jobs are all about selling more complicated, lower line width, modern silicon processors where, where we're trying to use less, as little of that as we possibly can. Using less energy seems like Spartan radars hit the nail on the head for electrification of EVs. It seems that your radar could win a competitive advantage over another company's radar because of the low power, because it, it, you can essentially make the argument that our radar will allow you to have a longer range, more battery life. Yep. Well, the the power piece, radar will absorb a little or use a little more power on the transmit side. That's going to be 
similar across across the board. But but of course, if if you you can't run a GPU in an EV <laughs> because of its power requirements, we everybody knows about Bitcoin mining. The reason Bitcoin mining is so power hungry is because they're using GPU to do it, right? So I just don't see a time where an OEM especially would be like, well, that's a great idea. Let's put this very power hungry thing in the trunk or wherever and, and depend on that for our navigation or ADAS. It just doesn't make any sense. The, the shift towards low power is only going to continue. It's going to become more and more prominent across multiple industries. What are some of the main applications for radar? You mentioned Air Force. I We talked about railroads earlier. Could you share some examples outside of mobility where radar is actively being used? Yeah, for sure. So a really interesting piece is, is in-cabin. So you can use radar to monitor the heart rate of a driver. It can see through your chest and basically you listen to your heart. I mentioned it. It isn't it's somewhat of an interesting thing to think about it. It sees speed. It can see other things like micro Doppler with which you can use to, to monitor heart rate. You can then use that heart rate data to determine if a driver is fatigued or not. Your heart rate changes as you become tired or excited or obviously. You can model that using AI to determine the person's sort of state whilst driving by only looking at their heart rate. And of course, you can also detect position, head position. You can't look at the eyes, you can sort of surmise physiological aspects with, with head position, body position, uh, heart rate. You can also use it as an occupancy monitor. Of course, you don't want to leave someone or something in the vehicle. Radar can be used in those situations to just detect a human or an object in a vehicle inside the vehicle. So, and, and that was a new one for me. The heart rate thing is, is pretty fascinating. I just, just learned that a couple weeks ago, but that opens up other applications, of course, where you want to do those sort of observations. The heart rate is the most fascinating use of radar I've ever heard. If you have the heart rate of a driver, I'm going to fast forward into the future, not going to put a timeline in this. And there's a passenger or passengers in a level four autonomous vehicle going around and somebody starts having a cardio, a cardiovascular issue, commonly known as a heart attack. How incredible would it be if this technology can say passenger A it looks to have symptoms of a heart attack, rerouting vehicle to you're in LA to Cedar Sinai or to St. John's Hospital in Santa Monica. You're phenomenal. Got to give you a shout out. Incredible hospital. Reroute them to the hospital. The hospital gets a notification. Patient A is, is having potential heart issues. That could save a life. That could save a lot of lives. Eye watches and these things that are monitoring our heart rate can already detect arrhythmias and conduct heart attacks. This just gives us uh, sort of external way to do that in something you're probably spending a whole lot of time in. And I think if you want to extrapolate that even further as sort of a, a wellness vehicle, it could observe your heart rate every day and look for long-term trends in, in the way it's changing, which may be indicative of, a, of an issue that you might, maybe it doesn't need to take you to the hospital. It says, hey, Cameron, you, something's weird here. Maybe you should just go visit the doctor. I'll make you an appointment. <laughs> so certainly I think, integrating health and wellness into these systems, it, it, it makes sense because we can. You're going to need occupancy monitoring in a level four, level five vehicle, absolutely. So why not get those added benefits of uh, making sure your art's okay too? The other added benefit of the occupancy monitoring, there's no camera, so you don't know who the person is, male, female. Yeah, you wonder about the, all of those, you know, most of these systems, the ones I've seen demoed by, by Aptiv, Super Cruise, they look at your eyes, they look at your face, they, they have video of your, your face, they know who you are. The Americans seem to be oddly less concerned with this. We, they want some freedoms, but they don't really talk too much about uh, the freedom of not being videotaped. But that is an issue certainly in Europe and certainly a, a, something to be concerned about going forward. And this also bleeds over into the using it as a primary sensor for autonomy, it can't differentiate one person's face from another. It can tell that you're a person, it can tell how you're moving, how tall you are, how far away you are, but it cannot tell who you are, which I think is important. And it's something that probably the U.S. probably should focus on more is, is uh, the privacy in all aspects, but, but that's a big part. It's strategically important. The privacy debate is only going to heat up as criminals and organized crime and nation states start hacking our systems. 
and you read it all the time. Data breach here, credit card breach there. They know who your information is and say, oh, Mr. Doe? Okay, Mr. Doe, let me, let me Google him. Oh, I got all his credit permission. Now I got his photo. I can build a driver's license now. That's scary. And that's why we, we really have to focus on privacy. And I'm happy that Spartan Radar is, is looking into how to protect the privacy and while do, also doing good with the health and wellness because you're, you're checking both amazing boxes. So Spartans come out of stealth. I I knew you when you were in stealth. I'm the cool guy. You got 60 patents, a $10 million seed round. I said, okay, we got some octane in the tank here. They're, they're getting ready for liftoff. So what's next? Well, we, we've kind of rounded out a basic product line already. That was the goal really of this year. It was to develop where we're going. So that's kind of bifurcated into a mining or a product directed towards driver alert. So again, on the anonymy theme, it is a radar-based backup camera where it has an alert inside the cabin to tell the driver there's an object behind you, next to you, in front of you. And of course, in large mining vehicles where you've got very little field of view to see what's around you. So we're, we're chasing that space. Those types of sensors exist, but we're, we're entering that space with a a newer sensor, and that'll actually be on sale as early as the end of this year, early next year. That product is called Hoplo. Our software product, which was the original idea for Spartan was to be a software company because many of those patents we have revolve around these algorithms. So a really interesting kind of channel we found that's getting great traction is offering these you know, noise reducing, range increasing, algorithms to other people that are producing radar. So those interactions might involve, you know, we can just take their raw radar signals, show them how we can improve this resolution using our our algorithms and and offering that that would live on the edge of someone else's silicon. That product's called Augo. And that'll certainly has great scalability because it's it, it lives on silicon. You can have iterative advances on the software signal processing side without changing a whole bunch of hardware. You can also sort of, you know, eliminate issues that an existing radar might have by doing novel signal processing techniques on the back end. Radar as a service. I love it. I absolutely love it. For sure. And even more fascinating things we're discussing is using radar as a communication method. You know, radar, you can send coded messages on a radar. Radar can receive and decipher coded messages. So imagine a cyclist with an active reflector. There's a really neat company out of the UK, or a radar company that's making these active reflectors that would send out a radar chirp that says, I'm a cyclist. And then it gives you the ability to see a cyclist from very far away in the dark and know that there's a bike there. And the founding story on that one was the, the founder... Clem, who's a, uh, is also a, a, an amazing uh, mountain biker, almost ran into a cyclist on a dark lane on the UK at night and instantly had this aha moment of like, I couldn't see the reflector. You know, everybody rips their corner cube reflectors off their bikes because they're not cool. But a radar reflector gives the ability on us to kind of solve that vulnerable road user problem. And having an intelligent radar that can detect and decipher those signals is this is a little further out, but that's something we're interested in. And obviously applying that same idea in other areas, maybe mining where we're using trading signals to say, I'm coming down this tunnel and I'm telling you in another sensor is there listening as the approach to to eliminate impacts at, at intersections and tunnels and things in the mining space. So, and all of this is privy to everybody in the defense world. These things are just starting to kind of percolate down into the into automotive and automation where it's we have great ways to use all of this stuff absolutely when you put your radars on mining trucks which are super cool they're big there's big rocks and boulders down there do you have to build a special case so if a rock hits it or dirt gets on it or mud gets on it or something that it doesn't stop working yes absolutely so the cover of the radar is typically called a radome another great word but that's just the plastic piece in front of the transmitters and receivers. Of course, in modern vehicles, you're typically putting another layer of plastic over that. In the vehicle space, 
road going vehicles, passenger vehicles, it's done cosmetically. But in the mining space, cosmetics are less important. You don't necessarily need to cover the radar. It is a fully potted device. It can resist certain impacts, but they're still typically put in boxes that are made of some kind of radar permissive material that creates some sort of protection, mainly for impact, right? So you can have a pretty good amount of dirt and dust and and moisture on the sensor with with very little effect of the performance to a point. Of course, two inches of of muck on the front of the thing might cause some issues. But it, it, it obviously, the duty cycle is far greater than an optical device that has a lens or something that's going to get very dirty. There's certain designs where you could kind of accommodate it. And radar is great in that respect because you can put it behind a plastic shield and the radar signal being a relatively large wavelength goes right through it without that much attenuation. How large is the radar? And if you already have a big cat operating down there, can you put it on there? Do you have to, or how does that process work? Uh, the integration piece, the radar are relatively small. Um, the Caterpillar, the, the haulers we're talking about already have a considerable sensor array on them. Many of them are probably using radar as a redundancy. So, But they're just using a standard automotive radar that probably has doesn't produce the granularity of information that we can provide. You know, automotive, if you get a Conti or an Aptiv, it just gives you very coarse information because they're doing all the processing before they send out that signal. So we want to open up the radar a bit more so you have point cloud data. And integrating it on a big vehicle like that is just a matter of getting the right field of view. And I guess that then leads to the fact that looking at 4D or 3D, 4D radar, where the radar isn't just a giving you azimuth information, you get elevation data. So this allows the ability to mount it way up high or higher. And if you have a maybe 30 degree opening angle in the vertical, you can observe something right on the ground immediately next to the vehicle, as well as something quite a distance away. Larger fields of view for sensors like that just make a safer situation because you're not gonna miss something very, very close to the vehicle. Spartan's doing this incredible work in radar which raises the question for me was there a lot of innovation happening in the radar segment outside of dod before spartan was founded there are a number of startups and i can kind of without naming names talk about their approaches so some of them focused on the beam moving issue to kind of simulate or go after a lidar because it sort of looked and felt the way it operated like lidar. It's, it's scanning the scene in a raster pattern and can pick out objects. But they're not focusing on the signal processing or the entire systems engineering approach. They've putting a, the car in front of the horse. They've got good beam steering, but if you don't have good signal processing on the back end, you're still not making a big advance. And on the other side, there's companies that have really focused on the AI processing of returning radar signals and can put bounding boxes on people and make identifications. They've focused on the AI piece. So developing machine learning algorithms on what I think is subpar radar signals, it makes for a good demo, but in the wild, it isn't going to be very robust. So I, I feel that we are unique in combining architecture systems engineering, signal processing. So you have a very holistic approach to the product that gives you what you need as opposed to one piece that might be fantastic, but doesn't really give you the whole equation. Great respect to all everybody in the space. It is a very small space. So we all, of course, know each other. And it's different than LiDAR, I think, because of radar is a little more of a of a monolith as far as the technology. There is still close collaboration between us and pretty much every other radar player out there. There's no doubt as we've learned throughout this conversation that Spartan's innovating. You're going to build something that's going to be a tremendously profitable company, but you're going to do good by society. You're going to save lives and the individuals are having the heart attack and go to the hospital. The individuals running the mining company can operate a more efficient mine. The individuals deploying autonomous vehicles can operate and deploy them more, more safely. So I tip my hat to you and the team at Spartan, and I can't wait to see what happens as you continue to grow as a company because you're onto something here. I appreciate that, Grayson. And Cameron, as we look to wrap up this extremely insightful conversation, what would you like our listeners to take away with them? Well, you know, at the end of the day, if you think about what these sensors are for, the biggest thing is they're for safety, right? The radar 
can stop your vehicle before you crash into the back of the, another one. I, I have very lots of buddies with vehicles that have automatic emergency braking that rely on it exclusively. It's a tremendous technology that saves lives, it reduces insurance costs. So at the end of the day, thinking about autonomy, it isn't a big scary monster driven by AI that's some mindless things. And I've heard these characterizations. It's It will result in a far safer society. It will result in greater efficiencies in logistics, lower insurance rates. There's a shining path to where we're trying to go. And I think having the the public get on board with with how we think about things and the benefits of it is is the job of our careers to kind of promote and evangelize not just AI that people don't understand, but the fact that this thing can stop your car before you hit somebody on a tricycle. Public trust is the most important thing that we're going to deal with. And you said this earlier, but I want to say a huge thank you for being the safety driver for the SAE Demo Day in LA because we we're able to put hundreds of individuals in your autonomous stuff vehicle to experience technology for the first time because what we were doing with SAE with the demo days was to build public trust. And as an industry, we all want to build public trust because without public trust, this all collapses. And and thank you again for building that public trust and for sharing the story of Spartan Radar with us today because the future is bright, the future is autonomous, and the future is Spartan Radar. Cameron, thanks so much. Thank you, Grayson. You're welcome. Bye-bye. Thank you for listening to the Road to Autonomy podcast. If you've enjoyed listening, please rate, review, and subscribe on your favorite podcast platform. Want to get in touch? Follow us on Twitter at Road to Autonomy or email podcast at B-R-U-L-T-E-C-O dot com. The Road to Autonomy is produced by Brulte and Company. The views and opinions expressed on the Road to Autonomy podcast do not necessarily reflect the views and opinions of Brulte and Company. The content discussed in this podcast is for informational purposes only and should not be taken as legal, tax, investment, or business advice.